Hey guys, Lynn Burke here, Blue City Music Owner, with my good friend Mike Soldano. Uh, Mike's uh, the owner, founder, Soldano Custom Amplification, out of Seattle, who's in Los Angeles, back in Seattle. And for this video, we're just going to let Mike talk about some of the highlights, uh, some of the good times, uh, the relationships, uh, some of the things he really enjoyed about having this business and doing it for over 30 years. Uh, so stand by, we'll have a good video for you. Hi gang, so welcome. This license plate. This is the license plate that was on the back of my 1938 Chevrolet when I took off and headed for LA in January of 1987. So this is kind of where Soldano Custom Amplification technically got started. Prior to that I was Soldano Guitars and I was building guitars in Seattle, but the yeah, app thing started basically in Hollywood in 1987. Um, yeah, so I had this cool amp, the SLO. I'd already uh, designed, and built, designed and built this amp for myself. It was mainly just strictly for me. But it turned out that it sounded really good and people really liked it. So it was like, hey, there might be a product here. So I was just kind of getting tired of working in an auto body shop, which I'd been doing ever since I was in high school. And so that by 1987, that had been almost, oh, let's see, that'd be about 13 years I'd been in the auto body business. So off and on, you know, I had some other interests in there too. But I decided it was time just to do something with my musical deal. And uh, I kind of decided that being an art, uh, performing artist wasn't really in the cards, but that maybe I could be useful as a guitar maker or even an amp builder. So, um, like I say, 1938 Chevy, this license plate, I-5 southbound, January 87. Miserable weather to be traveling in, I'll tell you right now. It wasn't a fun trip, but landed in California, stayed with a relative for a few months, and then I finally found a shop uh, that I could afford to rent on um, Melrose Avenue out on the east end of Melrose, not not the nice part of Melrose, kind of out in the out in the uh, the shadier part, but it was affordable. And so, 780 square feet, um, got a lease on it. Moved in on April Fool's Day, 1987, uh, April one, and uh, that was the beginning of Solano Custom Amps. And uh, we were there. We were in Hollywood for about about three years, yeah. And then in '90, we moved out to Van Nuys, California, into a brand new industrial park because we needed some more space because business was finally getting some traction and taking off. Um, and then about four years, five years after that. We packed up and moved back here to Seattle, which is my hometown. So, uh, and that's where we are now. We're in the second shop I've been in Seattle. When I first landed here, I was in a part of Seattle called Ballard in a 5,000 square foot building. Now we're in, um, in a part of Seattle called Inner Bay slash Magnolia slash Fisherman's Terminal, which is just a stone's throw south of where my old shop was. Um, and we're in about, uh, total about 9,600 square feet. So anyway, that's just, that's that's the timeline for the, the travels. So a lot of people wonder about those first, that first time, those first months and maybe even year or two in California. And uh, that was just, that was just a hard, uh, you know, a hard time to get started in a business in a place where nobody knows who you are. So for about the first year in LA, I had really nothing going on. I was doing any kind of jobs just to pay the rent on the space I had gotten. So I was doing sheetrock contracting and for my cousin and uh, picking up little odd jobs where I could. And I was doing guitar repairs and amp repairs. Because when I first moved down there, I really had this different vision. I didn't know that manufacturing was going to be my main thing. I thought really what I'd be doing more of is having a guitar building shop, doing amp repairs and mods. And then maybe building a custom amp here or there, just onesies, twosies, and not really a full-blown deal. But when I got to L.A., I realized just about everybody and their brother was a guitar maker. So 
the guitar thing was way too competitive. People were doing fret jobs for 25 bucks just to get the work, you know. It was, well, okay, that's an exaggeration. It's probably more like $50, but it was very inexpensive compared to what I was used to because um, I'd worked at Stars Guitars in San Francisco for about a year uh, in the early 80s. And up in the Bay Area, we used to be able to get $200 for a fret job in 1982. And so when I went to L.A. and in 87 saw that you could get a fret job for $50, mm -hmm. I realized that guitar work wasn't really where it was at. There's too many guys doing it. So I concentrated all of my efforts into uh, the amp side of it. And that's, like I say, April. By, by April, I had made up my mind it was going to be an amp shop, not a guitar and amp shop. And uh, so I started Soldano Custom Amplification. And um, prior to that even happening, I had my first sale to an artist um, shortly upon arriving in LA. It was around the end of January. And uh, some friends of mine invited me to go have pizza at the Rainbow up on Sunset. So, you know, it's like they were showing me around, you know. So we roll into the Sunset kind of early, about 7.30 or something. The place is pretty empty. Um, on a weeknight, and we're sitting at a table, and um, Howard Lee from Heart walks in, and he goes and sits down in this big old booth, you know. And my buddies all go, "Hey, that's Howard Lee," and I go, "Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Yeah, I think it is." And they're like, "Oh, why don't you go talk to him?" And I'm like, "Oh man, he's you know he's 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 here waiting for friends. He doesn't want to be bothered, you know." And they're like, "Oh no, come on, go talk to him." And I'm like, "Oh, you know, I'm just not comfortable." And so they're like, "Look, there's nobody there. Just go over and say hi." So I finally did. I got, got up on a chair, walked over to the booth, sat down. Went, um, hello, Mr. Lee. My name's Mike Soldano. I'm from Seattle. I know you're, you have a house in Kent, you know, and I, you know, I, I know about you guys. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, yeah, we're in Seattle, you know. So we started chatting a little bit. And I said, so um, the reason I'm talking to you is because I've, I've got this, this amp that I build that you, you might be interested in checking out, you know. I, it seems like something would be kind of up your alley. And, He's like, oh, really? Tell me about it. I said, well, you know, it's all tubes. It's 100 watts. It's got a really killer lead channel. It's a two-channel app. It's got straight overdrive. And he's like, well, yeah. He says, I'd love to hear it. You know, I'm like, really? <laughs> I was like so surprised this guy's even talking to me. And he's like, yeah. He says, as a matter of fact, we're Hart's working on a record right now with the Rumbo Recorders up in uh, Chatsworth and, uh, or Canoga Park, Chatsworth. I, I, I can't remember now. One of the two. Out in the valley, kind of West Valley. So... Anyway, he, he says, well, we're going to be up there tomorrow morning. Why don't you, you know, bring that amp by and let me check it out. So um, so I'm like, cool, great. Go back and tell my friends at the table. We're all excited and giddy about all this. And so next morning I pulled out my map guide back in those days. That was before, uh, uh, you know, GPS and all that junk. So pull out my Thomas guide, figure out where the hell I'm going, jump in the car, and throw the amp in the back, and I drove out to Canoga Park and buzzed myself into the studio. And, and uh, Howard shows up and is like, "Okay, let me let me see what you got there." And so we set this thing up on top of his Marshall stack that he was recording with, and plugged in, played about three notes, and it's like, "I gotta have this amp." And I said, "Well, that one happens to be my personal one, but I'd be happy to build you another one." He goes, "No," I said, "I want this amp right now." And I'm like, "Well, okay, I guess that can, that can happen too." And he says, well, I don't have my checkbook, so I'm going to, I have to run out to Malibu to get the checkbook. So he jumps in his bright, his red 911 Porsche, powers on out of the parking lot, and he's gone. So meanwhile, I'm hanging out in the the uh, lobby at the studio there in the lounge area watching CNN on a big screen. And um, Well, at least in those days, it was a big screen. I mean, they're much bigger nowadays, but that was a big TV for back in, those, in that period of time. And uh, so I'm just kind of hanging out. And, Pretty soon, Nancy Wilson strolls in with her dog and sits down on the couch and, hey, who are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm Mike Soldano. I came here to show Howard Knapp. Oh, really? Fine. Yeah. So we start chatting. And, you know, of course, I'm from Seattle. They're from Seattle. and So we're, we're chatting that up. And then, you know, a little later on, Ann Wilson cruises in. She plops down on the other side of the couch. And like, hey, Nancy, who's your new friend? You know, and so we get, all get introduced. We're all hanging out. And, um... A little bit later on, the, the production manager walks in. He goes, hey, Mike, join us for lunch. We're going to, I'm going to get some takeout from the barbecue joint down the street. What do you like? And I'm like, well, whatever you guys are having, you know, I'm just kind of here waiting for Howard, you know. And so, uh, so it was really fun, you know, that 
barbecue barbecue came. We had a great lunch. We all big smiles. And then Howard comes squealing back into the parking lot with the Porsche, whoops out his checkbook, writes me a check for the amp, and uh, sends me on my way. And and he's to this day, I believe he still has it, serial number eight six zero zero two. So uh, anyway, so that was my first big art, artist sale in. Uh, in Hollywood, and then uh, then it was a big, long, 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 long dry spell after that. And it wasn't until the following fall. Yeah, I think it was fall. Oh, 87 or 86? Well, this would be 87, so it'd be like late, late 87. Um, a friend of mine, well, a guy I met, basically, who had moved down from Canada, a guy named Tony, um, he had come to work, had come to my shop and asked me if I, he could work for me. And I said, well, I don't, I can't afford to pay anybody, including myself, but if you can sell something, you know, I'll give you a 10% commission on it, you know? And so he was out there hammering the pavement all summer long, taking around one of my demo amps to, to show to people and, you know, making calls on studios and stuff like that. And he finally got a meeting with um, Steve Lukather. And so Steve heard the amp. Fell in love with it, had to have it. Tony calls me on the phone all excited. I was all excited. Oh, my God, you know. And so Steve writes Tony a check. Tony brings me a check back. And then we, that was our second our second big sale. And then, um, and then very shortly after that, or actually maybe right around the same time, like within maybe a few weeks, um, Gary Hoey came by my shop, and this is when Gary had first moved to Hollywood himself, and uh, and he'd known about my stuff. He'd he'd come and check me out, like right when he had arrived. You know, he he'd heard about what what I was doing, and came down and heard the amps, and uh, so Gary swings by, and he's like, "Hey," he says, "You want to go see Aerosmith tonight?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I don't have a ticket." And he goes, "Don't worry about it. I, we don't either." But you know, I know, I know Brad Whitford. We'll, I'll get us in. He says, "Let grab an amp. Let's bring an amp with us." And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> so we headed headed down to Costa Mesa. Went to the Costa Mesa Amphitheater down there, and uh, <laughs> and it was just, you know, it's like I don't think you could do this stuff nowadays. But you know, it's like Gary just comes cruising right at the gate, tells the security guard that we're here to deliver an amp for Brad Whitford, and I'm holding on to this amp, and you know, and he's all. He, I got to give it to him. He was just so like, he just was so confident that it was just like the guy couldn't have said no. And so this guy lets us in. And so we get in, we go backstage and, and, and it turns out that, you know, he actually did know Brad. They were friends from back in Boston, you know? And so, you know, it was kind of homecoming for those two. And then Gary introduced me to Brad and said, Hey, here's my buddy. He makes this really cool amp. You ought to check it out. And so Brad's like, sure, why not? So we, you know, we plop it on a 412 backstage. He plugs it in, rocks it out for a few minutes. It goes, God, this thing's awesome. I, I'd love to have one of these. Do you, would you mind if I tried it out tonight? And I'm like, no, not at all. And he goes, well, you guys just stay and watch the show. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this thing out. And if, you know, if I like it, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll buy this from you. So, so here's this amp that he's played less than five minutes. And Next thing you know, we're out watching the show, and up on stage, his marshals are nowhere in sight. He's playing Solano. He's he an amp he'd never really even used before, and all of a sudden he's playing a show live with it. I thought, wow, that's really cool. And after the show is done, he's like, yeah, I got to have this thing. You know, go talk to so and so. And he turned me on to tour manager or somebody, and the guy takes me back into the trailer and opens up a big green face full, full of cash. And how much do we owe you? You know, pays me for the amp. I give him a receipt and. Uh, and Brad Whitford got his SLO 100. So that's kind of how it went those first those first couple of years down there. It was just all these chance and lucky meetings and and uh, and introductions and stuff. And we sold a few amps that way. And and then once those people had the amps, especially Luke, he really put it in front of a lot of people's eyes because he was tied in with the whole LA. Um, recording you know in session group you know he knew all those guys you know michael landau all those cats and so he really did a lot to get the word about the amp out and uh and news like that generally travel and he's you know friends with bob bradshaw of course and everybody 
So we're, you know, stuff like that travels kind of fast in that circle. So next thing you know it, um, I'm getting a call from John Sir, who at the time was building guitars at Rudy's Music in New York. And so Sir Guitars. And, uh, and at that time, uh, Mark Knopfler was playing his stuff. Lou Reed was playing his stuff. A lot of people were playing his stuff. Great guitars. And so... So, you know, he starts asking me all these questions about, you know, about Luke's new amp, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Sir was a good friend with Bradshaw as well. So they were, it was all very family-like, you know. And, uh, and at about that same time, um, I got introduced to Andy Brower, who had Andy Brower Studio Rentals at the time in North Hollywood, which is where Luther and Landau and Frampton and all those cats kept all their gear. So he had a cartage service and a rental service. So um, so these guys would keep their gear there because then when they had a, a gig, they'd just call and he'd send his guys out to deliver it to whatever studio and they'd just walk in and play what they had to play. So, of course, Andy was real excited about Steve's new amp. So, you know, so I got introduced. We, got, we became friends. And... Um, and at the time, Andy was writing a column for Guitar World Magazine, a gear column. And so he's like, I want to review this amp for my gear column. I'm like, cool, I'm all over that. So uh, so Andy did a review of the SLO 100. It showed up in Guitar World in early 88. And then things just really started taking off. So um, yeah, it, it, got, it, it kind of went from zero to 60 in a really short amount of time. Like. Uh, well, and, okay, so backing up again, I'm kind of skipping around here a little bit. Backing up from that, so I had some friends, I had a friend of mine from Seattle who had moved to L.A. a little bit before I did, and she was playing music around there, and she was really good friends with all the girls in the band Vixen. So um, during the slow time when I wasn't selling any amps or doing any guitar repair and trying to find money to, to pay the rent, um, I was a uh, roadie for Vixen for a short length of time, and it was fun. I really enjoyed it. Jan was like one of the most wonderful people to work with. She was just so friendly, and she was an awesome player, and uh, treated me really nicely, and uh, was very respectful of you know the fact that I was letting her borrow gear and stuff. And she was very grateful and really a charming, charming woman. It's 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 too bad she's no longer with us, but. Anyway, um, the reason I mention that is because I came home from really late one night from a Vixen gig. I finished dropping off all the gear. You know, we from Long Beach up to North Hollywood, or um, no, it wasn't North Hollywood. I think it was. I think they were out Tarzan or somewhere, Reseda, somewhere like that. Anyway, long drive out, then all the way back to Hollywood. So it was really late. It was like four in the morning. I came in and the light was blinking on my answering machine. That's before voicemail. We had answering machines. The light's blinking on my answering machine. And normally, you know, I just go to bed. I was tired. But for some reason, I just really felt compelled to pick up the machine, pick up and check the messages. Even though it was 4 in the morning, I wasn't going to be able to call anybody back, right? But I just had to do it. For some reason, my brain was like, you got to pick up that. And it was really amazing. I pick it up and there's three messages in a row. One of them is from Lou Reed. One of them was from uh, Michael Landau, and one was from Vivian Campbell. And they were all wanting to know about this new amp that Luther had, you know, and that they heard about. Well, Lou had heard about the amp through John Sir, because he, like, say he was playing John's guitars. And uh, and I was just like, you know, pinch me. This is just going, this is crazy. All of a sudden, you know, going from having to be a roadie to just pay the rent to, Maybe I'm actually going to have some customers, and so uh, the next day I, you know, I got some sleep. The next day I woke up in the morning, called everybody back, and they were all really on board. Uh, Lou wanted to try an amp out, so I, I uh, told him I'd get one built and I'd send it to New York, and he could try it. And if he didn't like it, he could send it back, and I'd give him his money back. And um, Michael Lando just plain placed an order for his. He's just like, okay, just build me one of those amps. So, and uh, and Vivian Campbell wanted a rack mount amp, which I didn't offer yet. So he was the inspiration for sitting down and designing the chassis that became the rack mount SLO. And <coughs> and um, was like in the thirties, though it was a thirty number serial number, wasn't it? You know, I sold quite a few before that, right? 
Yeah, you know, I can't remember. 35, 36, 37, Yeah, it's probably, yeah, because by the time I developed it, I mean, because it took, you know, it took, so literally to draw the, the drawings for the chassis, I hadn't really, my shop was still kind of, you know, getting set up. So I was sitting, I was sitting on the floor on a futon with my drawing board propped up between two chairs. So I was kind of sitting on the floor drawing and that's, and you know, all pencil and paper, you know, wait for AutoCAD and all that crap. And, uh, and I still prefer pencil and paper for anybody who's interested. It's like, I, I just really like the feel of drawing, you know. But anyway, I laid out the whole chassis and we, and I went from concept to finished product in a little under six weeks. It was just, you know, just like pedal to the metal. Let's get this thing done. You know, we aren't screwing around here. And so, yeah, so he got the first of the rack amps. But boy, after that, things just really, you know, 19, by spring of 88, things were really cooking for me. And uh, and uh, around that time, Mark Knopfler came on board. Um, he, too, had heard about the amps from John Sir. And so, uh, so Knopfler, Mark Knopfler, who's one of my favorite artists, uh, he started playing playing Soldanos. And so then that year he did a farm aid tour. I think it was farm aid. It was one of those kind of big benefit type of concerts. And in his band, Eric Clapton was his second guitar player. And so, uh, so they did that tour together. And later in that spring, Clapton was going to go on tour. And so he decided he wanted Mark to be his other guitar player. And so apparently they were in rehearsals down in Texas, I think it was, or something. And I get a phone call from a guy named Lee Dixon, who was Eric's guitar tech. And Lee's like, okay, Mike, he says, whatever those amps are that Mark has, Eric wants those. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, you know, pinch me now. I could die and go to heaven. You know, it's like I'm building amps for Eric Clapton, you know, one of my, one of my hugest heroes. And, uh, and so it turns out, I guess, that basically in rehearsals, it was like Mark's tone was just so much better than the stuff those amps that Eric was using at the time had that Eric was just, I got to have this too. So uh, unfortunately, I was out of parts. I couldn't build anything at that moment. Um, so they started the tour. Eric borrowed one of Mark's amps because Mark had two of them. And then um, about couple of weeks into the tour, I was able to ship Eric Samps off to him. And then later when, when uh, his band rolled into the LA area, I finally got to meet Eric Clapton. And that was really a super monumental experience. I was just like, it was a stack, right? Not, not this one, no, this, this, this came later. So um, this, this chrome stack behind me here that you can see, is it in the frame there? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so that came a little later. So, so Eric got all squared away with his stuff. He had a pair of gray heads. He was using Marshall cabinets that I think might have been loaded with EV speakers. I'm not sure. I know Mark had EVs in his cabinets, but I'm not sure what Eric had in his. Anyway, a couple of heads. Well, fast forward a few more years, and it's uh, it's 1993, and we're, we're moved out to Van Nuys. We just finished doing the NAMM show. And so that year at the NAMM show, my back line in my booth was a checkerboard of chrome wrapped, you know, aluminum mylar wrapped uh, cabinets like these and then purple ones. So we had a checkerboard, chrome, purple, chrome, purple, full stacks all the way across the back of the booth, alternating colored heads on top. It looked really sharp. And so we had just gotten back from NAMM. I get a call on the phone early afternoon or late morning from Lee Dixon. Mike, we're going to be in town. We're doing creams being inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Do you have any gear that Eric can borrow? And I'm like, well, I'll make sure I've got some gear. So um, I had some of these cabinets left over from NAMM that were still sitting in the shop waiting to be sold. And I had an SLO from that whole back line. And I'm like, I'm, tell me where you guys are at. I'm coming. I'll bring it on over. So Turns out they were rehearsing at um, Power Plant Studios, which were um, up in North Hollywood. My shop was in Van Nuys, so kind of across the valley. And uh, 
And so I just threw everything in the back of my station wagon, zipped on over to the studio, rolled the stuff in, and I, I came into this room that was, could have been the all, a who's who of rock and roll. Uh, Robbie Krieger from The Doors was hanging out. Um, uh, Eric and the guys weren't there yet, but um, uh, producer Tom Dowd was there, who did all the you know the Cream albums and stuff, and um, and it was just like really amazing. So, so I dropped off the gear. Lee and uh, Lee and I got it all set up up on the practice stage and everything, and um, and then I was like, Lee, do you think I could just hang around and like see some see see Eric or at least see him play or something as well? He says, you know, there's this, this is pretty. This is a pretty locked down deal. He says, just kind of come and hang out with me in my little spot back here, and I'll make sure that you know you can stick around for a while. So I kind of just hid out in the back, and eventually, uh, uh, the guys stroll in, and I can't remember what the order was. I kind of think, I think Jack Bruce got there first, and so he kind of rolled in, and he was you know big meet and greet. All the A and R people from all the record labels were there. All the big you know, mucky mucks in the LA music scene were, you know, there and all the rock and roll hall of fame people. So it was really a super schmooze fest for sure. And then eventually Ginger Baker walks in and, you know, and he's like, oh, you know, like these guys haven't seen each other in like a million years, you know, hugs and, and all kinds of fun stuff. And then Eric walks in and gets all situated with the guys. And then, uh, you know, and then and and to show you how gracious of a guy Eric Clapton is, it's like after he got took care of all of it, you know the important business, he was still like, okay, he says he's like he he was talking to Lee, and like Lee is Mike still around? I don't want to thank him for the amps, and he you know he excused himself from his group, actually walked over, said hello, thanked me for letting him borrow the stuff, you know, and uh, chatted me up just a little bit of small talk for a few minutes, and then like, well, I got to go back to work. And I'm like, yeah, by all means. So they went back and and. Uh, I got to stick around long enough to see them play. Um, I think they started out with White Room, and then I think they did Sunshine of Your Love. And, um, maybe uh, they played three songs that I got to see. I can't remember what the third one was now. Sorry, brain getting old. But anyway, it was just amazing because I'd never gotten to see Cream when I was a kid because I was just a little too young. My parents wouldn't let me go to shows. Um, and so I never got to see them in their heyday, but I did finally get to say that I saw Cream live because I saw them rehearsing at this uh, at this induction rehearsal. And then, of course, the evening event was a black tie affair. There's no way I could have snuck into that, no matter how hard I tried. But um, anyway, yeah, they uh, it was it was pretty fun. They uh, I saw my amps up there, and then later I saw pictures of that stack on stage at the uh, at the performance place in Century City where they did it. And uh, so, yeah, it was pretty fun, pretty exciting. Um, when you were with Vixen, uh, uh, who, who else was in that band? At the time, it was Vixen and then also the Runaways at the same time, wasn't it? How, how did you hook up with Lita Ford? Lita, I met through her guitar tech, Gavin Menzies. Um, so what shop were you in then? Van Nuys? Yeah, I was in Van Nuys by that time. And uh and I don't remember how I met Gavin. I think Gavin was a friend of my uh my awesome assistant Penny. So I think Gavin knew Penny and then I, I met Gavin that way. I can't really I can't really remember because Gavin worked for many artists. I mean he worked for all kinds of guys at that time that were, you know, major major guys and uh but it was through gavin that i i met lita and you know and, and uh that was really fun too she was a lot of fun and then um at the time in vixen um there was Cher. uh she was in the band then uh, Roxy Petrucci was playing drums. She had just come on board. She replaced this girl named Lori. And, uh, and I think Jan was singing, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was pretty much, I, I think it was pretty much the original lineup, except for the drummer, because Rox, Roxy was kind of new. And she was a character. She was a lot of fun, too. 
Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the Hollywood days. That was kind of the start. And then after that, it was just, man, I was so gifted to be able to work with so many really amazingly talented guys. It was just it was really, it was really exciting. It was a lot of fun. Well, the guys that are looking at this video that are really astute, they might notice over your right shoulder, uh, SRV's head hiding back there. Yeah, that, that tweet yeah. went back there. That, was, yeah. that ended up being a 1990 model. So how did that come about? Well, um, oh, it is a 90, isn't it? Yeah. 411. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even remember that myself. <laughs> well, the way that happened was um, I went to see Stevie at the Greek Theater, and I don't remember how we got backstage. Somebody knew somebody, and and again, I oh. It might have been that they were on the same bill. Okay, my memory's fuzzy about this, so this may or may not be factually correct. They may have been on the same bill as the Allman Brothers. They, it might have been, I think it might have been Stevie who had opened for the Almonds. And at that time, uh, Warren Haynes had just started playing with the Almonds, and he was using, and he was totally in the SLO, yeah. And so I think maybe that's how I got backstage was via, um, uh, excuse me one second, that's the thing. Okay, so I, I th so I think, I think, I think Stevie Ray was opening for the Almonds. And again, okay. my memory's a little foggy, so. I know that I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan at the Greek, and I know I saw the Allman Brothers Greek. Whether it was the same show, I can't be sure, but it seems like that makes sense because that's probably how I'd get backstage because I had just sold Warren Haynes his first SLO, and uh, and he was you know and he was in the Allman Brothers. So so I think I I got introduced to Stevie Ray Vaughan, and we started talking, and you know and he he'd heard about me from you know people talking, probably Warren or whoever whoever we knew there. And so I said, you know, I asked him, I said, would you be interested in us, you know, building you some kind of amp to, for you? And he says, well, he says, you know, I'm always interested in trying out new gear. So he says, I, if, if you don't mind, you know, putting something together and send it to me to try out, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to see what you got, you know, and super nice guy too. Really chill, really laid back, very, very, uh, very down to earth. Really, a, really a nice guy. And what year was this? Well, was this I, I'm guessing it must have been about ninety. Yeah, well, before he passed away. Then. Well, yeah, oh yeah, shortly before, like just several months. It was. It's probably in the springtime prior to that summer. So he got back to. He was doing good at this point. Oh, he was doing great. I mean, God, his, his you know albums were selling like a, you know hotcakes, and you know everybody wanted to be him. So you know that come good doesn't get much better than that. So anyway, so you know, we went back to the shop and decided to you know build build something we thought he'd like, and so um, you know, knowing kind of his sound, we thought that he'd probably want kind of a more scooped out mid kind of thing because that's kind of what he gets with the Fender amps and stuff, you know, the supers and whatnot. So we built an SLO one hundred, and then Bill and I designed and built a. Uh, a mid-range scoop circuit that we just wired into it with a switch on the back so that he could run it as a stock SLO where he could flip the switch and hear it with this scooped out voicing and see what he... And again, this was just a test mule. We just, we just want to see, you know, are we in the ballpark? Do you want?